Ah, righty everybody, welcome one, welcome all, thank you so much for being here today, uh, which is uh, going to be one of our last lectures, honestly. Um, so, just to kind of wrap things up, we, uh, project seven, or assignment seven, I think uh, the grade scope closes tonight, so if you've got questions about that, let me know. We have assignment eight left, and then our final, which is on our last day of class, which is April 29th. Yes, it's April 29th, so that's in a little less than two weeks. So here's how it's gonna go. We're gonna finish up our Java multi-threading lecture today. That'll give you all the tools you need to kind of do the threading side of assignment eight. We are going to have a history lecture next Monday. It's a one-off. I'm gonna just talk about stuff and things that kind of connect the past to now. Uh, it's gonna be kind of ranty to the surprise of absolutely nobody, um, but that's Monday. And then next Wednesday is a review session, and then, then it's the final, right? So we really are kind of in the home stretch here. Um, as for grading, <clears throat> I have maybe about half of the exams graded. They will be done by the end of the week, come hell or high water. I don't quite know um, how, but they will, they will be done. Um, so we will have our exams back. Assignment six will be part of that. I'm getting the exams done first because those are harder. Um, but once the exams are posted, assignment six will be close behind, and that should give us a pretty strong idea of where we're standing. Um, I'll try and get assignment seven graded as quickly as possible, but unfortunately, my, my, my uh, galaxy brain idea was to write a program that I need to manually download and run every individual program to verify that the graphics work, so that might take a hot second. Um, <clears throat> but I'm gonna try and get grades turned around as fast as I can so you all kind of have an idea of where you are in the course. Also, course evaluations drop, I think, start of next week, so I'm gonna start kind of making, making moves about that, um, and you'll kind of hear my spiel about it uh, at lecture Monday, but that is uh, coming down the pipe. Again, if we hit 80% completion, we get some extra credit, so definitely be prepared to uh, take those evals when you uh, see them. Um, I mean, I've got more time today. I'll take my, I'll do my eval shtick today. I'll do a shortened version on Monday. But basically, <clears throat> two incentives, right? The carrot and the, I mean, it's meant to be a stick, but it's not really. The carrot and the other carrot. Um, the carrot and the piece of candy, I guess. But basically, the more boring, but uh, very uh, genuine uh, kind of reason I would ask for you to do the course evaluations is, you know, feedback is like the most valuable tool I have to make things better. Um, both for this course specifically and for my teaching in general. Uh, I know 403, a lot of you probably aren't gonna have me again, but um, I mean, think of your peers and your fellow community. It's really appreciated. Um, and I wanna emphasize that these um, course evaluations are 100% anonymous. They're super, and uh, not, I'm not gonna try and make that a verb. But basically, they're very anonymous. They, they don't just not attach your name. They actually jumble up all the answers for each section all together, so you can't really do pattern connections. Like, truly, it is um, a completely anonymous set of feedback. And so as a result, I really do ask for your kind of open and honest and genuine feedback on this course and, and on the teaching. Again, y'all's feedback is the thing that makes, uh, you know, um, that, is, that's, that, that matters and is important. So I really appreciate it. Um, and then the candy is if 80% of y'all do it, then you get extra credit. And it's like one of the only extra credit opportunities in this course. So I highly recommend, um, <clears throat> highly recommend that. Uh, the extra credit tends to go in the assignments category. So, you know, basically we're talking about free points on an assignment and that tends to have a pretty positive impact on everybody. So um, again, that is the uh, course evaluations. I think they come out at the start of next week. So when you see them, if you could get a chance um, and complete them as soon as you can, um, I will keep everybody updated on what our current course percentages are. Um, but yeah, do the evals and tell your friends. Um, and yeah, thank you all really uh, so much uh, for that. So that's the course evals, and that's the status of our work. So I think with that, we can kind of jump in and just kind of dive in and finish up this multi-threading conversation. So, <clears throat> so to get started here with multi-threading, 
Um, where we left off last Monday was we started to kind of both introduce a lot of the terminology and the concepts behind multi-threading, and we saw some basic multi-threading example. In specific, we showed that in Java, we have a single program, which is a larger process that the operating system gives some memory, some resources, what have you, and that process has a single thread. This is called the main thread, and it's the thing that is executing the code in your main method, right? When you start a program, there is a main thread that spawns and executes your code. Now, you can also create thread objects in your program, and these thread objects you can create, define their behavior, and then you can start them. You can also use the join function to have a caller thread, wait for, well, basically you have the join function where you have the main thread wait for the you know, created thread to finish, and when the created thread finishes, the main thread picks back up. It doesn't just have to be the main thread, but sometimes it's hard to keep which thread you're talking about um, clear. So, you know, we have the join command, and if we want to signal to a created thread to knock it off, we have the interrupt method, right? But an interrupt is simply sending a signal, sending a request, and that request can be ignored by the target thread. If you tell a thread to knock it off and you interrupt it, if that thread checks its interrupt flag and respects it and decides to see that it was interrupted and shut everything down, it does what it's supposed to do. But if it ignores your interrupt flag, if it's being rude and puts on its headphones and pretends it doesn't hear you, there's nothing really you can do about that. You just kind of have to hope the thread ends eventually. There were, at times, um, techniques to just stop a thread dead in its tracks, but this was deemed unsafe. The primary reason has to do with one of the big kind of consequences of multi-threaded code, which are critical, uh, critical sections and mutual exclusion. The idea that there are going to be some sections of code that is not, quote, thread safe, i.e. it's not safe for multiple threads to be accessing <coughs> this section of code at the same time, right? It can make data incongruities or other kind of logic uh, traps. Um, and so, Mutual exclusion is the act of basically being a little gatekeeper, a little uh, you know, bodyguard outside of the club or whatever. The idea that this kind of mutual exclusion device lets in a thread and then blocks all the other threads from coming in until the thread that was in the critical section departs. All right? So a mutual exclusion um, technique is a way to make sure that there is a critical section where only one thread at a time can be executing, and uh, the um, <clears throat> mutual exclusion is the way we enforce that requirement. Okay? <clears throat> and so, Basically, that is kind of where we wanted to, uh, where we kind of ended, right? We were talking about different ways to enforce mutual exclusion. We saw in a demo that without mutual exclusion, if we have a shared resource and two threads are trying to use that resource at the same time, it ultimately loses a piece of information. And so what we were really jumping into before we left off on Monday was our first mechanism for enforcing mutual exclusion, which is a semaphore. So a semaphore, um, and again, we're gonna use the classical example of a semaphore, where a semaphore has a single key to provide to a single thread that gives it access to a specific critical section. Technically, Java semaphores can have multiple keys, sometimes referred to as permits, but we're not going to use that feature. We're gonna just think of a semaphore as having a single key or permit that it gives to a thread. If that thread has the key, it can use the critical section, and if it doesn't have the key, it can't use the critical section, right? And again, this is why we got rid of the stop and suspend methods. Because if a thread is holding on to a semaphore key and using that to access a critical section, and you kill that thread unceremoniously, it dies with the key on it. And it goes, and it goes away, and the key goes away too. 
And so if the killed thread dies with the little semaphore key, that means no other thread can get into the critical section, which means your program is going to have all of its threads waiting around to get into this critical section without the ability to ever actually get in. The key has been lost, so they're all waiting for a key that will never come. This is called deadlock. Right? Deadlock is when your program doesn't crash, but it locks up because all of your threads are waiting for some other action that will almost certainly never happen. But the trick about deadlock is it's almost certain, but it's not possible to prove that it will never happen. It kind of relates to the halting problem from 303, the idea that you cannot verify the difference between a program that will be in an infinite loop and never end, or a program that's just taking a very, very, very long time. There is no way to mathematically verify the difference, right? The only way you know if a program will finish is to just run it until it finishes. It's not finishing in a reasonable amount of time doesn't prove it will never finish, it just proves it hasn't finished yet. And that distinction makes deadlock a very challenging thing to mitigate because the compiler cannot just recognize, oh, this has been stalling for a long time, let's break up the party. Because the compiler cannot guarantee that it's not just waiting around for something that's actually taking a very long time. Right? It can't tell the difference between a situation where like, a key has been lost and it will never ever return and so everything is permanently kind of locked up waiting or the difference between something where everyone's locked and waiting for something that's just taking a very, very, very long time, which will eventually finish, and then the program will continue forward. And because you cannot tell the difference between those two circumstances or situations, the compiler can't help. So it is up to the programmer, 100% on the programmer, to make sure that the multi-threaded code we write never ends up in a situation where it is waiting for a situation or some event to occur that will never occur, okay? So basically, it's a bit of a house of cards, and we're on our own. We need to make sure that this house doesn't topple over. We don't get any help or support from the compiler or from the language. It's really on us as programmers. So, <clears throat> with all that being said, I wanted to kind of show how we can use mutual exclusion via a semaphore to enforce a basic you know, exclusion policy so that two threads sharing a common resource can utilize that resource without it going um, up in flames, okay? So let's take a look at the code. Mm. Okay, so if I take a look here, Let's take a look at this guy. Here is message semaphore, and I'll come back to the main in a second because I want to kind of show what we've done here. Um, we look here at class semaphore sender. Now, this was our unsafe sender that we saw on Monday, and unsafe sender has an object here which you know, has a string variable called message, and this uh, object has two uh, methods, send and receive. The idea being that you send a message, and it will receive your string, store it in its instance variable, and then when you call receive, it will print out the value stored in its instance variable. This is meant to kind of simulate like a telegraph wire or something akin. And so we saw that this was unsafe, right, because <clears throat> Two threads which share the same unsafe sender object both call send one after the other. And whoever calls send second erases the data that the first thread put in there. So basically, you know, two threads call send and they both print out that they're sending a message. But when both threads call receive, only one of the messages is actually received and it's received twice. The first message is lost. <laughs> And so the question is, how can we use a semaphore to prevent that from happening? How can we use a semaphore to make it so that only one thread can use this unsafe sender object at a time? And so if I come into the semaphore object class, <coughs> well, 
we can see here that our unsafe sender is unchanged. It has the same instance variable and the send, send, and receive methods. Nothing here is any different. So where does the semaphore come in? Well, here the semaphore comes in in the thread object that we're subclassing. So here, rather than creating a runnable object via a lambda to define the behavior of our thread, I'm actually subclassing the thread class so that we have instance variables that our thread owns alongside of the run behavior. Whereas the lambda really only gets you custom behavior, because I want these instance variables as well, it made more sense to subclass this and inherit all the properties and behaviors of thread and then add on instance variables and new behaviors rather than just providing a run behavior through lambda and passing that as the only thing. So basically, this semaphore message thread takes in a sender object and its message and a semaphore. So we're going to see that this thread not only shares a sender and, a, and has a message, but this thread also has a semaphore. And for this to work, we're going to need both of our threads to share the same semaphore. Okay? And I'll circle back to that, but that's important. So let's look at what the run method does. The run method does semaphore.acquire and acquires a permit from our semaphore. Again, we want our semaphore to have a single permit. I've been calling them keys. I think that's more intuitive, but Java calls them permits. They're the same thing. Keys, permits, I mean them as the same thing. And so here we're requiring the single permit that our semaphore has, and then we have our send, sleep, and receive. And then we have semaphore.release. So what this basically means is that in order for these lines of code to be executed, you need to be able to acquire the single permit that our semaphore has. If you call semaphore.acquire and there is a permit, you, can, you know that nobody else is executing these code statements. But if there is no permit available when you call acquire, you're forced to wait here until somebody releases a permit. And when the permit is released, you will receive a signal that there's a permit to acquire. You'll acquire it, and then you can execute your code in here. And so if we look up to the top here in our main method, we create a new sender object, and we create a single semaphore with a single permit, like a single key that it has to distribute. And then I create two threads. And we notice here that while these threads are sending different messages, they're sending them over the same sender object, and they're sharing a semaphore to do it. I want to emphasize here that the shared semaphore is vital for this to work, right? Because basically, both threads have the same run method. Okay. Both threads, when being run, <clears throat> will execute the same statements. But if each thread has its own semaphore, then that's not really an effective tool of mutual exclusion. If each thread has its own key, then it's not really a very exclusive area, now is it? Right? The exclusivity means that there is one key shared among multiple threads, so that each time a thread wants to come into this section, they have to get the one key in order to come inside, as opposed to giving each thread their own semaphore, i.e. their own unique key, so that everybody can just let themselves in whenever they want. Right? Because even if you have these acquire and release methods, if each thread has its own semaphore, it's literally no different than the unsafe sender. If you put a lock on the door and then give every thread its own unique key, that's the exact same thing as having no lock on the door. Right? So, with that being said, let's give this a run and see kind of what it does. We again expect that because there is the semaphore requirement, because you need to get the semaphore's single permit, and there is one semaphore shared between two threads, one thread is going to get here first, acquire the permit, and force the other thread to wait for that permit to be released in order for that second thread to execute its stuff. So let's run this and see if that actually happens. It should. OK. Look at that. Sending, received, hello, sending, received, world. So we can see here that this actually works. 
But one of the things I want to emphasize by rerunning this is let's look at the execution time. We see it's a little, hang on, I might put a sleep delay on this. <coughs> Oh, why really? Oh, because it's. <laughs> Hacky. I'm just doing this so I can zoom this in. <laughs> there. Uh, so we send world, we receive world, we send hello, we receive hello. All right? And so the idea here is that this is mutual exclusion. Right? The idea is that the first thread, but, but also notice, oh, I, okay, we got it, we got it. I didn't notice that at first, but I wanted to see this. This time when we ran it, the world thread got there first. This is a race condition. I know we start thread one first, and thread one has the hello message, but that does not guarantee that the thread one is going to actually get the permit first. I would consider it to be a tad bit more likely, but ultimately what thread gets to the critical section first is a canonical race condition. It's up to the Java runtime, the virtual machine, and it kind of does whatever the hell it feels like. It's not predictable. It's not deterministic, at least not in any pragmatic sense that is useful to us as programmers. And so basically, I ran it this time, and well, the world thread got there first. So the world thread got the permit, and the hello thread had to wait. And that's the other reason why mutual exclusion is so important. There is no determinism in these race conditions, right? There is no way of saying, well, we started thread one first, so thread one's always going to get there first, so we can leverage that to make our code work. No. There's no guarantee about when any thread shows up to any specific part of the program. You really do have to assume it's chaos every time, which is unfortunate <clears throat> for us as programmers, right? Assuming chaos gives us a lot less to grip onto than assuming predictability. If we can assume predictability, we can leverage that predictability to make quirky or easier, or hacky, and yet working code. But when it's complete chaos, we just have to kind of batten down and write robust, well thought out, well tested stuff, which sounds better and maybe long term is easier to maintain. But that's a lot of effort that has to go in and it's easy to make mistakes. So that's just kind of the reality of multi threading. The bar is quite high. The other thing I want to notice or note is that the execution of this takes longer than unsafe sender. Because of mutual exclusion, these two threads cannot really run in parallel at all. When we run the unsafe sender, we see that they send their messages at the same time and receive their messages at about the same time. Now, one of the received messages has been lost, but they execute relatively in parallel. Whereas now that we've enforced mutual exclusion, we no longer have that parallel execution, right? We spawn both threads to start, but the second the first thread gets the permit, the second thread just waits around for the first thread to finish and release the permit. And when the permit's released by the first thread, the second thread picks it up and starts executing its code. So even though we have two threads that can, in theory, run at the same time, because they're only executing a critical section of code, the uh, threads end up running sequentially. Run thread runs, releases the permit, and then the other thread gets that permit and runs its code, one after the other. And it, we can't even predict which one comes first and which ones come second. We just have to run the code and see what, which one comes first this specific time, knowing it could be different each time we run it. Whew. That's a lot. But that's multi-threading. I mean, this is what we call a crash course, because that is a lot of word vomit, but that's pretty much just all multi-threading is at its core. Multi-threading becomes a nightmare because the consequences of making this code more complex, I'm sure we can kind of see how we adding complexity to this is going to make it way worse. But this is the underlying principle that drives all multi-threaded code. And I think that the principles, if we distill an example that is small enough to grapple with in this kind of a context, I think you can get a, kind of an idea for what those principles are. 
because it's really good when you're doing multi-threaded stuff to make sure you really get the principles because once you start growing the scope of the code you're writing, the inherent complexity of multi-threading is going to come crashing down on you. So you really want to make sure that the basics are rock solid so it can support the weight of the nightmare code that you're writing on top of them. In a way that if you're just throwing stuff together in Python, you might be able to get away with not knowing as much because it will work. There's a lot finer tolerance for multi-threaded code. It's really easy to make multi-threaded code, which looks like it kind of works, but every 20% of the time, it deadlocks or something like that. You know what I mean? In Python, if you're just gluing random crap from the internet online over and over and over again, and you finally get something that works, it's probably going to stay working for the duration of how long you need it to work, which is probably about a month. And then it, you're done crunching whatever weird input data into output data you need to crunch, and you put it away forever. Whereas multi-threaded code, it's very easy to write stuff, test it, looks good, and then uh, you know, kind of launch it onto a larger system or with some new input data, and all of a sudden, a quarter of the time, it just freezes. That's, it's just way, it's way, low, you know, finer tolerances. A lot more room for error in multi-threaded code. Whew, okay, but rants aside, that really is all that I have to say about semaphores. Semaphores are really powerful tools and relatively simple ones in order to enforce a level of mutual exclusion. I simply um, <clears throat> want to reemphasize for a final time, this only works if there is a single semaphore shared between threads. If you give each thread its own semaphore, this doesn't make any sense. Again, the point of semaphore is to put a lock on the door of a critical section and have one key for that lock and give that one key to each thread one at a time. So one thread gets the key. When the thread's done with it, it gives the key back so that another thread can get the key. If you give every thread its own key, then you may as well not put a lock on the door. Okay? I just want to emphasize that. That's something I've seen come up in the past. So, so with all that kind of being said and established, why, why do you, why, why keep going? <laughs> We've got semaphores. Why, why, why not just stop there? Well, so here's the thing about semaphores. Again, the principles I like, but let's keep expanding of what happens when we add complexity. So although semaphores themselves are protected, there's no protection against their incorrect use by programmers, which is one of the most passive aggressive bullet points I think in any of my PowerPoints full stop. All right? Semaphores themselves are great, but programmers are idiots is basically what this is saying. All right? And uh, unfortunately, there is some truth to that. One of the things I like about multi-threading is like there's a very common kind of attitude in programming that like the user of your program is a moron. And there's, I've, I'm conflicted about that. On the one hand, it is a good perspective when writing code to assume that people will use it in the worst possible way and that your code should handle that. On the other hand, I do think the chide attitude of, oh, every user's a fucking moron tends to leak into how we view the people using computer science products, particularly if I look at Silicon Valley in the past 10 years, where we see our users more as, you know, products to be squeezed for capital than actual human beings with lives. I do think that the attitude has some downsides and some consequences we don't really talk about much in the industry. And I like multi-threaded code because it really puts the mirror into the face of the programmer. It's not the user who's being an idiot, it's you, the programmer, doing a bad job at writing multi-threaded code. <clears throat> so uh, I just kind of think that's funny because usually uh, that is the attitude we take towards multi-threaded. Multi-threading's fine, programmers screw it up, which makes sense if we're giving grace to it. Multi-threading is very, very complex and it's very easy for the human mind to be like, oh, I thought that was this and this is that. And again, very fine tolerances. A lot of times, mistakes like this in uh, like a normal Python program that just transform text A into text B, those errors you'll see at runtime or compile time, you'll identify them, you'll fix them. Multi-threaded errors can just be a lot harder to suss out. The type of thing that would cause an exception in Python that you would identify, fix, and correct might cause deadlock one-fifth of the time in multi-threaded code. And it's a lot harder to notice what's going on if that happens. Because again, deadlock doesn't crash, everything just freezes. So unlike an exception that tells you this went wrong and this is why and this is where, multi-threaded code sometimes just, yeah, every one in five times, it just doesn't seem to finish and I had no idea why. And there's no clues or hints. 
doesn't tell me what's going wrong. Everything's just kind of sitting there frozen. So again, <clears throat> not to be mean, not to be too mean to us programmers, but um, certain Silicon Valley types can use the humbling. So I don't know. I like that contrast. But I'm sounding preachy again. Can you tell it's April? <clears throat> so some of the issues that we might encounter with semaphores, there might be an incorrectly defined critical section. Okay. Again, comically listed as critical mistake on these lecture slides. I don't think I made that one. I think, this, I think that's a holdover from, from long ago. Um, but yeah, basically, if you think a critical section is between points A and B, but it's actually between points A and C, well, the semaphore is going to do its job all fine and dandy, but you've misdefined the critical section, and that's going to cause problems. <clears throat> right? Um, another example is that... Um, Sometimes you write code that ultimately does this. You force a, a thread to acquire two keys before entering the critical section, even though there might only be one key available. That will cause problems. That one hopefully is more obvious because your code would always deadlock. But there also might be situations where you have multiple keys floating around, and this normally is fine. But in some specific circumstances, every thread has one key, and then one thread needs two keys, and it freezes up, never lets go of its key, and everyone else needs a second key that isn't there. And yeah. So like again, most of these errors come from programmers messing up where to put their critical sections or how to set up the permit or key acquisition and releasing. Um, <clears throat> I've already, <clears throat> oh, jeez. <clears throat> I've already talked about how these things can cause deadlock, right? I've mentioned deadlock a number of times. And basically, I don't want to go into this example, right? I think I've had enough deadlock examples already. But I do want to state that these difficulties with semaphores push developers to think is there a better way? Is there a way to handle mutual exclusion that doesn't require me manually creating semaphores and explicitly defining the start and end of critical sections? I, a programmer, am not super confident with my ability to do that without screwing something up. And so, in response, we also invented a concept called a monitor. Now, semaphores are still very much a thing particularly in lower level languages like C, but a monitor is something that is what's traditionally used in Java, <coughs> and we're gonna kind of explain why. So, okay. I'm gonna kind of go through some of this generic concept, but I'm gonna spend most of my time talking about practical Java implementation of this. So a monitor is a synchronization construct that impl implements mutual exclusion. It encapsulates shared data, and it encapsulates these operations on data. At most, one process at a time can be using any of the monitor's operations. Monitor has an associated wait queue to track processes that are waiting to use its operations. So let's kind of just take a second to peel back some of this language here. A monitor encapsulates shared data and operations on these data. Wait. Encapsulates data and provides operations. This sounds like an object. And I personally think when we're thinking about <coughs> Java monitors, we should think about them as objects. Okay? The idea here is that a monitor can be used in conjunction with an object to provide mutual exclusion for selected methods in that object. A monitor is also very nice <clears throat> because it has automatic queuing. The idea that you know multiple threads want to use an object's method, synchronized method, and only one thread can use a synchronized method at any given time, but the monitor has pre-built support for queuing up and having everybody wait around for their turn at the method. So,
Uh, I don't care. I'm going to talk about this relative to the Java objects. I'm not going to talk about it in theory. Um, oh, maybe a little. Basically, the idea is that a monitor also has something resembling a semaphore. It has condition variables. Um, and each queue of processes is waiting for the condition, and each has an associated suspend and continue. So if a continue queue is empty, a call to continue will have no effect, and suspend always suspends the current process. Um, basically, bleh. the idea here is that it just tells you that if you have a queue of uh, threads waiting to use a specific synchronized method in a monitor, then you know you have a level of suspend and continue operations, right? You can tell something in the queue to kind of wait back up, or you can tell them in the queue to wait, right? You can have kind of explicit signaling. Now, yeah. I mean, again, I will reference this when we talk about practical Java objects. I don't want to get too theory. This is a little too theory. But I will say, it's possible to imitate the behavior of a monitor using semaphores. So what I kind of want to say here is that uh, monitors don't really do anything that semaphores can't do. Rather, a monitor is meant to be an integration of those principles into an object so that we don't have to manually define like the start and stop of each critical section or make the uh, semaphore object completely you know out of nothing right the idea is that a monitor does a lot of the same things it just does them in a more integrated way particularly in java specifically and this is what i really want to focus on in java all java objects possess a monitor all of them it's built into every Java object that exists. Java objects which utilize said monitor are oftentimes called synchronized objects. Now, Java provides an entry queue for each synchronized object. A thread inside the synchronized object has a lock on the object. So basically, every object in Java has a monitor. And if you decide for that object to use the monitor, then the monitor provides you with basic synchronization techniques. It basically means that if a single thread wants to use a synchronized method, it needs to talk to that object's monitor, get the lock on the object, and that makes it so that a single thread has the monitor's lock, meaning that that thread and that thread only can access that object's synchronized method. Any other object that wants to use one of those methods has to get inside of a queue, which the monitor provides all of the signaling and handling for. We don't have to implement any of that. It's built in. Now, the Java queues don't operate in a fair fashion. Okay, So basically, if you have a group of threads all trying to use the same synchronized object, one thread gets the lock and can use the synchronized methods. All the other threads get in a queue. But it's not a fair queue. It's not first come, first serve. It's everyone get in a room, and when the key is free, we're going to chuck the key at you, and whoever grabs it, grabs it, and then they get into the critical section. Oh, you were here first? Well, too bad. That would involve more complicated algorithms on the monitor's part, and they didn't want to implement it. So it's just not fair. Deal with it. If you demand fairness, implement it with semaphores. Um, and yeah, <clears throat> this object lock, the monitor lock, only applies to synchronized methods, methods that are explicitly stated to use the monitor and need the lock in order to be uh, invoked. Um, Non-synchronized methods, anyone can call at any time. So yeah, yeah, they don't have separate conditions. That's why I didn't want to go into it. Um, only one wait queue per synchronized object for any and all conditions. Java has wait and sleep calls as suspend operations, and Java's notify and notify all calls are continue operations. When a thread comes off the wait queue, it must again acquire the object's lock. Awaken threads in Java must wait for the awaken in thread to exit the synchronized code. And as I mentioned, it's unfair, so these threads are not given priority over threads that may have just arrived in the entry queue. So basically, as I kind of mentioned, we have wait 
and sleep to suspend threads, we have notify and notify all to wake up threads. And the idea is that when a thread comes off the wait queue, before it can actually do anything, it needs to get its hands on the object's lock. So basically, you signal to, hey, come off the wait queue, and then can you get your hands on the lock? Or I guess I have been calling it a key more than a lock. It's the same concept. It's basically the thing that lets you into the critical section. Um, I should really clean up the language, because that is three different words for basically the same concept. Love that. Um, but basically the idea is when you come off the wait queue, you've got to acquire the lock before you can go into the critical section. Okay. So let's take a what it looks, let's uh, do, do, do. Oh, right, right, I forgot I was going to do that. <laughs> so this is what this might look like. If we want a method to use Java's the Java objects monitor, we apply the synchronized keyword to the method. So synchronized public void send is now the send method of our um, you know, sender object, but we're now using this object's monitor to guarantee that only one thread can use the send method at a given time. Okay. So every object in Java has a single monitor available to threads, when a thread attempts to execute a synchronized method, it must first acquire the object's monitor. If the monitor is being held by another thread, it must wait. After exiting the method, it releases the monitor. So the wait method is used to manually install a thread based on a testable condition. Notify or nor notify all is used to wake up a thread that is in a waiting condition. And I think actually showing this in code will make this make more sense. So that's how we're going to kind of finish out today. Oh, nope. Okay, so we have our thread, all right? We have our thread object. Now, you'll notice that this thread object is going to look a lot like the thread in the unsafe sender. This thread object has two instance variables, a sender and a message, okay? That's, that's all it has. Oh, come on, get in there. And all it really does is it, in its run, it calls send, sleeps the thread for a thousand seconds, and then it receives the message. That's all that's going on here. And when we look at the main method, we're simply creating two threads that share a sender, and then we start both of those threads. Okay, so if we're not using semaphores, how are we enforcing mutual exclusion here? How, are we, how is this different than the unsafe sender? And the answer is that rather than using an external semaphore object to determine a critical section, rather, we're actually going to define it via the sender object itself. So here we have a string called message. And basically, I have a synchronized method called send. Now, because send is synchronized, Okay, that means that in order to use it, <clears throat> a thread must acquire this object's lock, or you could call it a key. Basically, the thing that allows it into the method, right? And now each monitor has a single lock, and so if one object, excuse me, if one thread has this object's lock, only that thread can use this method. But it's not just this method. It's all synchronized methods in the entire um, uh, object, right? So basically, this object has two synchronized methods, but it only has a single lock. So if a thread wants to access either send or receive, it needs to acquire the object's lock. And if it can't, then it can't use either method. So, what are we actually doing here? So the first thing is that the synchronized keyword only guarantees that no thread, excuse me, what it guarantees is that only a single thread is ever executing send or receive at, the given, at a given time. So you cannot have two threads executing this method simultaneously. 
Either one thread gets in and executes it or the other thread gets in and executes it. If one thread is executing send and the other thread tries to call it, the other thread that's trying to call it gets rejected. It says you don't have the object lock, someone else has it, you gotta go wait your turn. But that doesn't actually solve the original unsafe sender issue. Right? If we look at just the normal unsafe sender, where is my guy? The issue was that we would call send, and then send, the first call to send would store its message in the message instance variable, and then the second thread would call send, and then, because it's a shared resource, store its message in this message instance variable, overriding and deleting the first message. How does making it so only one thread at a time can use send change that problem, right? You just are making it so that one thread uses send, the other thread waits till it's done, and then when it's done, it calls send on its own, and it still replaces the message with its, you know, with the second thread's message, right? The first thread's message will still be lost here. And so that's what this is for. <clears throat> Basically, what's happening here is we can not guarantee that, well, uh, I know, I want to say this in a way that makes sense, and I'm tripping over my words. Basically, we can make it so that only one thread at a time can call send. But the issue isn't that two threads are using send at the same time. The issue is a second thread can use send before the first thread has called receive. That's the issue. And how do I stop that from happening? How do I make it so that when the first thread calls send, it's not until the first thread calls receive that the second thread actually buzzes off and calls send. And that is what these wait notify messages are for. So with this wait call here, if message not equal to null. So what we're saying here is if you call the send method and the message is null, i.e. there is no message on the wire, then we skip this code you print out sending and you set the message equal to MSG, your input. But if someone calls send and message is not null, i.e. you're trying to use the send method but there's already a message on the wire, the thread who does this is told to wait. And they are told by the system to wait indefinitely until there's signal that it's okay to work again. So that is what's going on here. If you tell a thread to wait, you are, not, you, you are manually making it wait until you signal that it's okay to wake up, right? If a method is synchronized, Java makes sure that if two threads try and use a synchronized method at the same time, that's not allowed. One method, or excuse me, one thread will grab the lock for the object so it can use the method, and the second thread doesn't have the lock so it can't use the method, and it has to wait until the lock is freed up in order for the second thread to grab that lock and execute that method. All of that scheduling, all of that waiting happens behind the scenes. Java does that for you for free, you don't have to worry about it. But if we're in a situation where uh, we need a kind of more robust enforcement, where it's not just that we don't want the two threads executing the same method at the same time, but rather, we want a thread to execute one method than another before a thread's allowed to execute this, you know, its first method and then its second one. And so by doing this, we're basically saying, hey, this prevents two threads from executing <coughs> send at the same time. So that means the first thread that calls send won't release the lock until it actually sets the message, meaning that when the second thread comes in, the message won't be null. Whereas if this wasn't synchronized, two threads can come in here at the same time, and they both execute the statement at the same time. And the message is null for both of them because neither of them have set the message yet. But then the first thread executes this first, and the second thread executes the second, and the first thread's message is lost. So that's kind of what you need both of them for. The synchronized keyword makes it so only one thread can execute this at a time, and the message not equal null makes it so that if the second thread comes in and recognizes that the first thread's already using the instance variable to send data, that will some, that'll be something it actually notices because it isn't using send at the same time, right? Send 
had to be finished by the first thread before the second thread could look at it. So by the time the second thread gets here, if it's the second thread, the message will not be known. Thus, it'll be forced to wait. Wait until what? Well, that's where the receive comes in. We receive, we print out the message, we set the message back to null, because that's how we wrote this code. It checks if message is null. So if a message has been received, we set that message back to null, just so everything kind of clicks. And then we set notify. And notify is going to signal to any waiting threads in this object's monitor, hey, wake up, let's go, time, time to do things. And what's going to happen is if the second thread is waiting, it's now going to wake up, and it's going to call this this code, which is now going to be all good to do. Okay. Whew. And if there's multiple threads waiting, well, it's still a synchronized method, so only one of them can wake up because they're still going to need the object's monitor's lock in order to execute send. So let's give this a try. I think this works. Yeah. Sending hello, well, did I, did I straight up just not copy? No, it just prints out the message. OK. The semaphore does it. Yeah. <laughs> That's funny. Um, probably should have that there. That looks so much better. Um, but yeah. Oh, and look, sending world first this time. It's not predictable. So, <clears throat> sending, world, received, world, sending, hello, received, hello. This uses mutual exclusion through the Java object lock in order to do this. Okay. And just to kind of show something, if I get rid of this, which makes it, oh, are you really? Buzz off. And if I run this code again without the wait signal, This is what we get. This did, I just hit the wrong keys. Don't worry, don't worry about that. Um, but we, we send hello, and then we send world, and then we receive world, and we receive null. The second message, or I guess in this case, the first message is lost, right? Hello comes in. Basically, what I think is happening here, and it's always a little tough to think of how threads are running, because it's hard to debug and confirm. You just kind of have to think about how the computer executes, which isn't always predictable. It's a bit of a guessing game. That's part of the reason multi-threading sucks so much. It's really hard to verify what you're doing. Um, but here, thread one comes in and thread two comes in. And it has to be one or the other because they're synchronized. But one of them comes in, and the first one comes in and sets its message. But then the second one comes in and obliterates that message. So then the first thread comes in, and it receives and it receives the world message that was just sent, but then it sets message back to null, so the second thread prints out null. Okay. So if we get rid of the wait, right, then the only thing that stops, and then the only thing we have is the synchronized keyword, which prevents two threads from executing send at the same time, but if thread A executes send, and then finishes, and then thread B executes send, it still breaks everything. We need our code to force thread B to wait until the message is, well, if the message is not null, we force thread 2 to wait until it's notified that it's OK to go. What notifies it? The receiving of the message. So if thread A sends a message, and thread B tries and is forced to wait, it's up to thread A to notify thread B when it can pick back up. If I get rid of this notify call right here, we're going to see that the second message never gets received. Oh, it never even gets sent. And this is deadlocked. This is a deadlocked program because it will never terminate. Because our second thread is sitting here waiting for a notify call that will never happen. So the program is still running and it will run forever. 
because our second thread is waiting to be notified that it's OK to send a message, and that notification will never come. So this second thread will kind of just sit there forever and wait. And because a program cannot terminate until all of its threads are done, we have created a deadlock situation. This program will never end, but it will also never, it will, it will never, it will never terminate, it will never finish, and there's no way to do that or fix that other than just killing the program. Okay? Again, in this type of contrived example, it's pretty easy to see why there's deadlock here, but I, I think we can kind of um, extrapolate from this that if we had a very complex, messy bunch of spaghetti code that several people have been writing over the course of months or years, this is going to be a lot less obvious. And maybe it's a conditional branch that gets you to a situation where you don't notify somebody. And so it works most of the time, but in certain circumstances, the notify signal isn't sent, and so it deadlocks. Right? When we, it's already enough to wrap our brains around when we have these very laid out examples, but when we imagine the complexities of like real world code, yikes. Right? But I also want to emphasize there's a reason why Java is good for this. Java has a lot of these, these features built in. It has a lot of threading support. Frankly, if you want to write multi-threaded code, I recommend doing it in Java. I mean, look, you could probably do something in Go or Rust that's like actually better. But if we're talking our more classical languages, right, not the cutting edge like Go and Rust, but if we're talking Java versus C versus Python, the titans of the 2010s, and you need to pick which one to write multi-threading code with, pick Java, my god. I mean, sure, if you're doing operating system stuff, you got to use C. I mean, if you just need to do something jank like I do in the Project 7 autograder, you can use Python. The Project 7 autograder does have multi-threading in it, <clears throat> which was a nightmare. I hated it so much. Java, Python's weird obsession with global values makes it just truly awful. Um, I actually think Java, out of those three kind of Titan languages, is really your best bet for having to write multi-threaded code. One last thing I'll mention here, um, and I'm scared, but if I get rid of the synchronize keyword on this, but I still have the wait and notify, I think that still breaks it. But it breaks it in a different fun way. <laughs> oh, wait. Oh, 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 oh. I'll explain what that thread is, but let's just get rid of that. Yep, if we get rid of this synchronization, we have the same problem we had at the beginning. Even though there is this wait signal here, which says if message is not equal to null, wait. Because send is not synchronized, both threads access send at the same time. And both threads execute this code at the same time before either thread has actually set the value of message to anything. So both threads pass this check. And then whoever actually gets their message sent, it's a race condition. Whoever gets their second. Whoever gets their first sets the message to their message world. And then whoever gets their second replaces message with whatever their message is. So when both threads receive it, they receive the second message, both of them. And so <clears throat> even though we have this wait call here, if this isn't synchronized, this doesn't work because the two threads will execute send at the same time, check this if statement at the same time, and because both of them are doing this at the same time, neither one set the message, so this is false for both of them. And then one of them does this, and then the other one clobbers the first ones. So that's why you need synchronized and wait. And then why then did I need to comment out notify? Well, because both threads executing at the same time mean they skip this statement, meaning neither thread is told to wait, meaning when you go to notify a thread that it's time to pick up, there's no threads that are actually waiting. There's no one to notify. And that causes an exception in Java. If you try and notify an object monitor to wake up the waiting threads, but there are no waiting threads, instead of Java just shrugging its shoulders and being like, oh, I'm sure that's fine. No, Java is like panics and is like, wait, you want me to notify who? Ah, and it just crashes. Which, um, frankly, is not the worst situation. Right? At least it doesn't deadlock. Better a crash than a deadlock, truly. 
Um, do, 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 do. So that's uh, do, 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 do. that is. Oh. oh my god, I don't want that. Just to prove this does work. So this is object monitors. By the way, for the producer consumer problem for the project eight or assignment eight, I don't care how you do it. I really don't. Assignment eight is really just get it working. How is pretty immaterial. Okay? You can use a semaphore if that makes more sense to you. You can use synchronize and wait notify if that makes more sense to you. Does not matter to me how you implement it. If you do use semaphores, again, just remember one semaphore for multiple threads. But other than that, I don't care. Implement it however you want, totally on you. Um, that's, that's that. And uh, yeah, that's really all I have to say about threading. Any other questions about threading before we get out of here? Okay. I do have one quick rant, and I'll keep it at that. Basically, I just want to quickly mention Java Reflection. Basically, <clears throat> one thing I talked a lot about in this course is kind of um, safety. Right? language safety and how type systems provide us with a level of safety preventing um, things from executing at runtime that don't make any sense. Now, I should actually like open this. Now, Java has a strong typing system. It's a strongly typed language, right? It's statically typed. You provide data types to all your variables at compile time, and it has a lot of rules to kind of make sure at compile time that all the data types are doing all the things that they all need to do, and everything looks like it's going to play nice. But with all of its strong typing and rule systems, sometimes that can be a tad bit restrictive, right? So what if you wanted to bend the rules or break them entirely? Well, Java actually has a little way for you to do that. And it's called Java Reflection. Java Reflection is a feature which allows programmers to examine and modify the runtime behavior of programs running on the JVM. Runtime behavior in this context includes properties of a class, the members of a class, arrays, enums, Examine and modify basically everything at runtime is what Java Reflection is for. Okay? Java Reflection uses uh, basically, it is a library that allows you to subvert the typing system of Java. In Java, if an object has a private instance variable, that means you're not allowed to see it. Java Reflection allows you to get around this. And you can peek inside of an object and see what's actually in there, private or no. Java reflection is kind of, not to be too crass about it, but it's in a sense, uh, in a way, it's playing God in the Java virtual machine. Right? Java has rules, and you normally engage of it as a mere mortal. Right? The rules are there. This is private. This is encapsulated. You can't see this. Java reflection kind of puts you above all this and lets you see all the rules and kind of be a little, a little like Neo in the Matrix. I should say Trinity, but you need to have watched the fourth one for that to make sense. So I will say like, that's one of the things that Java Reflection is so interesting. It allows you to kind of elevate yourself above the strong typing system that Java sells itself for having and completely subvert it. Now, why would you do this? Now, oftentimes, like you do this for virtual development environments or debuggers, right? You're running code and you want to see what that code's doing. Java Reflection is a really great tool to kind of peek under the hood and see what the code is actually doing without any restrictions on like, oh, that's private, you can't see that. No, the point is to see what the code is executing, so you need to be able to see the hidden stuff if you want to understand what's actually going on. That's a good use. Another option is extensibility. The idea that you just write normal code that gets around the Java typing system by using reflection. This is a terrible, terrible idea. It is like buying a car with the highest safety rating for the purpose of it having a high safety rating and then gutting the thing, gutting out the airbags, taking out the seat belts. And it's just kind of like, why? Why would you do that? If you don't want all of this typing system, pick a language that doesn't have it, right? If you don't want a strong typing system, write it in Python, by God.
But no, you could, in theory, just write it in Java and then ignore all the rules that make Java worth typing in. I imagine this has happened <clears throat> a few times in history when someone at a job had a legacy project that they were told had to stay in Java and they were real grumpy about it and wanted to be in Python, so they used Java Reflection to basically make Java act like Python, which is, God, it's so cursed, and people do this. People do cursed things all the time, especially if they don't like their boss. <laughs> then it becomes someone else's problem. Lastly, sometimes it's used in testing. I abuse the hell out of Java Reflection in my 255 JUnit test cases for you know 255 to try and desperately confirm that 255 individuals are actually doing things the right way which does require completely destroying the type system, by the way. If I'm trying to take a bunch of people who have never coded in Java before and be like, you're making an object for the first time, you need private instance variables and public data, no, this can't be static, no, this can't be final, and you can't put this random modifier on there, no, this isn't actually correct, that can be really hard to just test for if all you're doing is being a normal Java user, right? If all you have is an object, how do you see if its instance variables are private or public? There's no real way to write that code. If they're actually private, you don't have access to them. For Java Reflection, right, you are the one, so to speak. You can see the matrix. And so you can kind of just pull the curtain behind and you can just go check. Oh, does this object actually correctly define all of its properties? Um, I already said this, right? You just. Java reflection is a really, it subverts the whole reason you use Java. So unless you're using this for a meta reason, like a debugger or test cases, you're, you, you, what are you doing? Like that's what's cool about Java reflection. It, it's there, it exists, so you can do things like write test cases, or you can do things like write analysis of code, like as a debugger or a development tool. And that's really powerful. That's actually a really awesome thing. You can write in Java, tools to debug and analyze Java. That's not something all languages can provide you. That's actually really nice. But if you go out of your way to not just use it for the special finite cases it's supposed to be used for and start abusing it and just treating Java like it's an untyped language, what the hell are you doing? Please stop, you're giving me nightmares. Um, <clears throat> I'll just wrap up by opening a uh, example of some of the absolute nonsense I've had to do for some of these test cases. So I actually methoded a lot of this out so that the J unit wasn't awful, and we're going to skip over a lot of the J unit stuff. But basically, one of the things I had to do was because I do not trust 255 uh, people to not screw up their constructors, I created a private method that creates their objects manually. So what it does is it does require that they have a default constructor. It creates the cargo flight object that they're creating, but then I can get the class and then I can get the individual fields from that class, set them to accessible temporarily, and then manually set their values. These are private instance variables. This is what Java Reflection allows you to do. It allows you to create an object and then take that object, rip it open, look at all its private instance variables, and shove data into them, even though you're not supposed to be able to access those variables at all. And that's really great. Because now I know when I create a new cargo flight object, I'm not relying on an individual to have correctly implemented their constructor in order to test their other methods, right? Like if somebody writes a piece of code that both constructors are borked, but their getters and setters all work, I want the test to reflect that. I want the test to fail their constructor tests, but pass the getter and setter tests. And so I can do that by not trusting their constructors to work and use Java Reflection to make the objects myself. All they need is to have a default constructor defined. It doesn't even need to work correctly. As long as it's defined, then I can make an object of that type. I can then find each instance variable, manually jam a piece of data into it, and then return the object that's created in the way I wanted it made, not the way they defined it. Um, this is the same thing, but a shipment object. Here we can actually just give it a field and an object, and we can basically just check to see if that given instance variable is or is not private. We can check to see if it is or is not static. We can check to see if it's a specific data type. Some of the typing, class, question mark, really great stuff. 
This is how you know things are going great. What's your generic type? I don't know. Yikes! Yeah, I did cudgel a lot of this together. I don't, don't ask me to get an in-depth detail of why that works. I do not know. Um, but it does. Um, you can test a variable. So if I have, you know, a test object and an expected value and a field to look at, I can take the object, open it up, grab the instance variable out of it, get its value, compare that value to the expected value, and determine if they match. So here, I'm not relying on the getter method for a specific object in order to retrieve data out of the object. I'm using Java Reflection to kick the door open myself, rip the value out of the instance variable in a way you're not supposed to be able to do, so that I don't have to trust that the individual whose code I'm grading implemented anything correctly. It's not good to do that. I've seen test cases like that where the test cases assume other methods that are tested other where in the test suite work in order for those tests to produce reasonable answers. And that is the most cursed BS ever. Intertwined tests like that are bad test design. Tests should be independent of each other. If one test passes, it shouldn't be conditional on other tests passing. It's just bad form. Um, <clears throat> create custom equality objects. I think there's also like methods for checking if specific instance variables are even present, but I think I didn't actually method that out. Um, yeah. I don't even know. Yeah, so that's really what's going on here. Basically, Java Reflection is a really powerful tool. It's just, uh, you know, use with caution. If you find yourself using this to test code or to do meta-analysis of code, you're probably on the right thing. If you're using this to make Java work like Python, if this class teaches you anything, it is that different languages have different strengths and different weaknesses. And when you go for a programming problem, you pick a problem first and a language second, not vice versa. You find your problem, you figure out what the needs of that problem are, and then you figure out what language best fits that problem. Do not start by picking a language and then figuring out what you need second. Because then you might end up doing shit like this, where you're like, well, I picked Java, and I just don't really need the typing system. So I'm going to just use Java Reflection to subvert the typing system. And you've created a cursed nightmare instead of just using Python in the first place, like you should have. OK? OK. I think that's enough moralizing for one day. Thank you so much for being here. That's it for lecture. We're going to have a history rant on Monday and then a review on Wednesday. So thank you all so much for being here. And thanks for the semester. Like This has been, this has been a really fun semester. I appreciate you all coming in. And especially for those of you who come in person, really appreciate you all being here. All right, thank you all so much. Bye, everybody.